thank you. First of all, I want to say how honored I am to be your incoming president. And uh, um, for those of you who are new to APS, I've said this a couple times, but I'll repeat it, that I dropped out of all the other organizations. I'm not even a member of my specialty society because for many of the reasons that George just went over. Um, you know, all the specialty societies do, it seems, or all the medical societies that I was associated with, all they do is try and get better reimbursements from your government shakedown artist. And honestly, this is the only organization that stands on the principles that I believe in of limited government and individual liberty and personal responsibility. So that's why I'm a proud AAPS member. I read a book this summer that had uh, really hit me right in the heart. And uh, I want to tell you about this young man because I, I felt kind of drawn to him. This is a young kid who, middle class kid, only child like I was an only child, grew up in a small town. Uh, all his life he wanted to be a doctor. All my life I wanted to be a doctor. He worked hard, he studied hard, and he became an orthopedic, with, although they didn't specialize in those days quite the way we do now. He, essentially, he was an orthopedic spine surgeon. Now, if you look on the internet today, you won't see this picture. You'll see this picture. Because this is Carl Brandt, he was Hitler's surgeon. And this is the day he was given the death sentence at the Nuremberg doctor trial. Now, one of the things we're taught, the historical aphorism, is that if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. And I think it's a little bit more than that. I think the problem we have is that we don't see ourselves in this history. I don't see myself ever in a dock with a translating thing on it. I don't see myself in a uniform having to defend euthanasia and the terrible things that happen in the Nazi regime. And so because we only see the end result, we, we don't see all the little baby steps that got him there and he, that looked just like us. And that's really, I think, the lesson of Carl Brandt and why I want to go into his life a little bit. Uh, Carl Brandt was born in 1904. He was the son of a policeman middle-class, blue-collar birth and, and, and childhood, fairly, perfectly normal. Um, his mother came from a family of doctors, and her, it's interesting that his grandfather was actually the first government doctor in Thuringia. And remember that under the Kaiser in the 1870s uh, with Bismarck, they, just, they were under the pressure of the Social Democrats who wanted to bring down the monarchy and start this very socialistic um, government. Well, the Bismarck thought, uh, let's just give them a little bit of socialism to stave off this huge amount of socialism that's coming our way. And they gave them socialized health care. And as in most socialized systems, early on it worked very well. It actually did stave off the takeover of the government. And that was the milieu under which Karl Brandt grew up. Um, by the time he was in medical school, most doctors worked for the government. He studied hard and was able to get a surgical residency, and, or actually studied hard, got out of the gymnasium, and went to medical school. And at the time he was in medical school, he studied with Alfred Hoche. Alfred Hoche, in 1922, published this article with a lawyer, uh, co-authored this tract, Permission for the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Life. And uh, this is a very infamous thing, but in the, at the time this was published, remember, this was being talked about, not just in Germany, but in America, about eugenics and, and population control and sterilizing the undesirables, etc. And they divided these groups into three groups of people, life unworthy of life. The, the terminally ill people who would request euthanasia. And then the last two columns were the incurable idiots and post-traumatic coma victims that couldn't ask for euthanasia, but they thought it would be good if their families would ask for euthanasia and the request then would be looked at by a government body of doctors, lawyers, and psychiatrists, that's comforting right there, who would oversee judging patients' economic value to society and applying cost-benefit criteria. You know, cost-benefit sounding very familiar. Essentially, what happened over those 40 years is that what was once done with individual ethics and Christian charity became a collective ethic of nationalized welfare. Now, all the great things that they were able to do when they had money fell apart when the economic bad times hit after World War I and became really extreme during the Weimar Republic and after the 1929 bank foreclosures. And so what they were left with was a very impoverished bureaucracy. And this is a very excellent article of, that I, I found. It's about Germany and the Weimar Republic. And notice he published this in 1993 in the Freeman magazine. Dr. Mark Mercosi, and it's really a great article about this whole issue. 
He said what remained of the humanistic goals of reform were state mechanisms for inspection and regulation of public health and medical practice. Essentially, doctors went from a private practice of treating the sick to a public health of preventive medicine. In fact, they were known as vaccination doctors. And physicians who were once advocates for the patient had become partners of the state. Now, uh, Carl Brown apparently did very well, and he was able to get a surgical residency uh, with Sauerbrook, who you know, was a very famous surgeon. And about that time, also, where he was, studying with Sauerbrook was a Dr. Bumke, who was an internationally known psychiatrist. And doc, at that point, this debate was ra raging about um, reforming psychiatry on an economic basis. And Dr. Bumke wrote in 1932, quote, one only needs to take the idea to its logical conclusion, that one should do away with all those people who at the time seemed dispensable for financial reasons in order to arrive at a rather monstrous result. We must kill not merely all the mentally ill, and the, and the psychopaths, but every cripple, including wounded war veterans, all the old maids who are not working, all the widows who no longer have children to raise, and all the invalids and old age pensioners. That would certainly save us money, but I suspect we would not do it. Well, in point of fact, they didn't end up doing it. Now, after he finished his residency training, he uh, was in practice in Berlin, and he met this young lady, Annie Reborn. And it's, it's one of those, this is probably, this, he had, one, he had this, the worst day of his life started right here. And he uh, was, uh, was with his fiance, and she was an Olympic class swimmer. She also was um, middle class, you know, birth and, and growing up, but, but she, was a, she was an Olympic class swimmer, and so she had come to the attention of Adolf Hitler. And, and it was very fashionable in those days in the summer for the people that were in the, in the know to go out and hang out around the Berghof where Hitler spent his summers. So they were out there, and she was invited to lunch at the Berghof with Hitler and the entourage. They were in a long, there was a long uh, motorcade of these guys, and, uh, and the very last car was driven by Karl Brandt. But the car in front of it was Wilhelm Bruckner, who... Uh, I don't know if he fell asleep or something, but he drove the car into the ditch and was very seriously injured. Carl Brandt jumped out and resuscitated him, took him in his own car back to a hospital, and operated on him. He had an open tibia fracture and a bunch of other things, lost an eye, and Dr. Brandt, oh, and his skull fracture, and Dr. Brandt took care of him. And during his subsequent vacation, stayed there and periodically nursed him and took care of him. So he came to the attention of Adolf Hitler. Well, he went back to his practice of surgery in Berlin, but Subsequently, you know, six to eight months later, um, Hitler decided he was, he was paranoid about being assassinated. He thought how nice it would be to have a general surgeon or a surgeon, trauma surgeon, follow him around. And so he called up Karl Brandt, who also had the misfortune of being tall and good looking in a uniform, and uh, asked him if he would be his personal physician. Now, unlike the other kind of sycophants that, that hung out with Hitler, the, 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 most of the guys were politicos, but there were a few of these guys that were technocrats, like Albert Speer and, um, and Carl Brandt, who actually made things work. And Dr. Brandt was often sent on fact-finding missions for Hitler. And one of the places he was often sent was to the Eastern Front to figure out what was going on. And Dr. Brandt discovered a couple things. There were, it was very poor medical support for the troops on the Eastern Front. There were no beds back in the rear echelon because uh, and and so, so the patients that were being stabilized on the Eastern Front were not be able to be transferred to the rear for, for follow-up surgery. And the other thing is that the civilians in the big cities were not having any place to go. And when Hitler said, well, why don't you research this and find out why, he discovered that because hospitals tend to be built in downtown major cities, they had all been bombed to rubble. The, the, so Brandt came back and said, look, we've got to do something about this. It's in total chaos. You're having lots of civilians die. You're having lots of soldiers die. So Hitler says, well, go out and come out with a solution. So he went around and he discovered that there were psychiatric hospitals out away from the downtown. They were made, the big psychiatric hospitals were made in these beautiful wooded areas out away from the cities, and they were, they were left standing. So his, his point was, let's move the psychiatric patients out of the psychiatric hospitals, and let's put in these trauma victims. We can easily you know, change the hosp these psychiatric hospitals into trauma hospitals. So Hitler said, make it so. Well, again, he went back out, and he discovered, he talked to a lot of people, and he came back and said, there's a problem here. 
um, there's no coordinated control over your medical system. There's all these little fiefdoms, and I can't get anything done. And he says, um, you know, you're going to have to give me some authority, at which point Carl Brandt became the, the chancellor, the head medical officer in Nazi Germany. Now, uh, then, so, and then, and he actually had effect. He got patients back from the Eastern Front. He, he would often jump in. When he went to the Eastern Front, he wouldn't just stand around. If he saw they were shorthanded, he would jump in, roll up his sleeves, and operate on people. You know, unfortunately, you read this in biography of Brandt, and you think, this is the general chief, chief, sir, chief resident you always wanted to work for. He worked harder and longer, and he was smart and a good guy, and he jumped in when things needed to be get done, and he had solutions. Unfortunately, those are also the, the qualities that, that led to the, the bad things that happened. So then we took the next and fatal step. Now he's faced with, he's, it's, it's, the, it's toward the end of the war, and they're running out of resources, and they're running out of food, and they have a problem. They can't feed everybody, and so he's getting word from the psychiatrist that these patients that have now been moved into these rear areas, the psychiatric and mentally disturbed patients are not being fed and they're having and the, the people in coma and things are starving to death and the doctors are calling him, the psychiatrists are calling and saying we are stuck in the middle and we can't stand this, this is horrible these patients are dying these horrible deaths, we would rather give them an overdose, we would rather euthanize them than have this happen and that's, that was the beginning of the euthanasia program run by the medical department. Now Here's the thing. <laughs> Carl Brandt, I'm not trying to be an apologist for the Nazi system in any way, shape, or form, but if you look at this scenario, you know, who of us who were in the military had, has not learned about you know, trauma triage? At some point here, um, I mean, Carl Brandt ran around trying to put out brush fires, trying to save as many people as he could, and ultimately, <laughs> Uh, but ultimately he was a socialist, and he believed to his dying day, to the day he went to the gallows, that the health, and this is, this is when he was being interrogated, and that's Leo Alexander on the right, this is when the health of the nation is at the issue, the health of the individual doesn't matter. That is the problem, that is the problem with his thinking that led to a lot of, a lot of I mean that's, that's the, the major heart of this matter, is that he put the, the, the health of the state above the health of the individual. Now, I guess the lessons that I would take away from this, and this is the lesson, first of all, that the Allied prosecutors took away. The French, British, and Americans all agreed that these guys weren't, weren't that Nazi medicine didn't end up with euthanasia and the experimentation program and everything else because these guys were inherently bad guys or genetically defective themselves. They, they concluded the reason that they did this is that they were government doctors. And this is Leo Alexander's exact quote from his, his outtake brief of the Nuremberg doctor trials. We should never let doctors work for the government again. Here we are 65 years later. What have we forgotten? Well, the next, the next lesson is when, when Hippocrates, when you take that oath of Hippocrates, it really does mean something. When he says, I will enter into the house of the I'm uh, into the house only for the good of the patient. What he means is, you're not entering for the welfare of the state, the welfare of some religious organization or the family that might inherit. You're, you're entering there for one purpose, and that's the patient. And then my, my son uh, is a follower of this guy, Stefan Molyneux, who's a philosopher on the internet. He's kind of a free market anarchist, but he says, he says, you know, you don't really have to fight evil because once something is identified as evil, we abjure it. We run away from evil. Nobody's going to bring back slavery because we all realize it's evil. What the problem is, is recognizing evil early on. And that's the problem here. The policies that led to the final euthanasia program were policies that early on didn't look evil to the people around them. And lesson number four is there's a great inertia that once started down a path, people stay down that path and situations don't change that much and it's very hard to get off the path. And that's my final thing is that sometime there's a time to get off the bus. You know, for Carl Brandt, when was the time to get off the bus? I would say surely before he had to make the decision to sign off on killing some people to preserve others, no matter how that fit into the trauma triage that he was taught and we were all taught. At some point, you have to get off the bus. Now, I, I thought this myself, will we know 
you know, for since 1943, the AAPS has been pushing to keep the bus in the garage, but unfortunately that bus is out driving around now and it's picking up speed. If every orthopedic surgeon in America today said, we're not gonna take Medicare, you know, I think it would probably bring the system down. But in the process, you know, this patient, this patient, this patient would lay there with their broken hips not getting fixed. That's, I think, the problem of jumping off a speeding bus. <laughs> And that was his problem. But I hope we will know when to get off. Now, in this somewhat tragic tale, there is one final uh, maybe good spot, if, if there is such a thing as atonement. Uh, I followed up a little on this, and I found out that Carl Brandt's son, also Carl Brandt, uh, grew up, and he became a surgeon. And he has spent his, uh, much of his life doing volunteer surgical missions into Africa. Thank you very much.